For those of you that did not know this, I used to be a creationist. That's right. I used to be somewhere along the lines between thick shades and a stump. Bordering more towards the stump. But um, that did not last forever, apparently. So, what happened? Well, let's kind of step, take a step back and go back to my early Christianity. I was a Christian, or believer, for those of you that don't believe I was truly a Christian. I went to church and believed that, you know, all that good stuff. When I was about 11, maybe 12 years old, and I'm 28 now, so that's, you know, 16, 17 years. Um, I became an atheist about 10 months ago. Um, so a good, again, 16 years as a Christian. Now, I was a creationist from, from a very young age, as my parents had taught me that God had created the earth. Six days, just like the Bible. Now, of course, I'm young, and I have no reason to think that my parents are lying to me, and I, I know they didn't think that they were lying to me. And then my, you know, all my people and family were at least believers in God. I had an uncle that was a pastor, you know, just, you know, we, we believed in God. Uh, and I never experienced any sort of cognitive dissonance because Louisiana, at being as a third most religious state, probably about that same time then, uh, everybody else believed. Even if they weren't really truly Christians, they still believed in God, and nobody ever was like, no, you know, God isn't exi you know, doesn't exist, he's not real, Pro you know, never got any sort of challenge, so man, I just... Okay, everybody else seems to believe it, so I should too. Maybe the whole world does, obviously. So for those of you that say that, you know, it's not true that just because you grow up somewhere that determines what religion you're going to be, full of shit. Um, I mean, yes, some people convert later on, and that's a different story altogether. But and, and maybe my story is anecdotal, but understanding the psychology of how the human brain works and, you know, what you do and what you believe as a kid because you're raised up, in a, you know, in a certain belief system, I, I have no reason to think that that's, that's not the case. And, and the numbers obviously show it. Um, but, so anyway, so I was a creationist, but, you know, I didn't have to worry about evidence or proof or anything like that because it was never challenged. So I spent... 20 plus years of my life with a belief that, you know, nobody ever questioned. You know, I experienced no cognitive dissonance. I had no reason to even doubt it. For those of you that are like myself and used to believe and used to go to church and used to go to Bible studies or, you know, remember reading the Bible from church, you know, what did they talk about? They talked about the happy, fun stuff. God loves you, and he's going to take care of you, and, you know, life sucks, but don't worry, God's with you. And then he talked he talked about, uh, you Christians, you need to get your act together because you're doing this, 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 and this, and this, and this wrong. And they just covered sin by sin, or, uh, or they covered maybe certain Bible stories. But they didn't cover all of those weird things, all those ones that would make you kind of scratch your head and go, what the fuck? Why is this in the Bible? Like when God wanted to kill Moses because he hadn't um, uh, circumcised his son. But thankfully his wife came along and cut the son's foreskins off with a sharp rock and threw it at the ground and said, you know, he was a, you know, a bloody husband or something like that. Stuff like that that would make you go, well, why would the Bible talk about this? What does this have to do with anything? Yeah, they, they, they kind of, you know, skip that. You know, they kind of skip over that. And that scripture is right after God tells Moses the very beginning of like what he's about to do. Like, you know, let's go go to the Pharaoh and free his people. And it jumps right into that weird story. But you know what? They'll skip that verse very quickly. So there's no room for cognitive dissonance or even things that would allow you to question. They're not going to talk about evolution most of the time unless they have a really good, you know, sermon about, you know, response to it or something like that. That's not what gets talked about. They aren't going to do anything <laughs> that can uh, make you less likely to give up your money. Well, maybe that's a little that's a little harsh. Well, they're not going to say anything that make you want to leave the church or make you question your Christianity. 
So if you're like myself and you spend a long time at that church and they don't ever talk about anything that could cause you to question uh, your beliefs or make you question the Bible or anything, then you have uh, Christianity is going to be found very deep within your bones. Um, but eventually you'll find something that can kind of change your mind or make you question things. It's going to reveal itself one way or the other. Um, and for me, uh, I was a very basic scientific fact that I had heard before but didn't really give it the full light of day. And what that thing was, uh, I believe, is best told by comedian Lewis Black. Was the Earth created in seven days? No. <laughs> for those of you who believe it was, um, for you Christians, uh, let me tell you, then you do not understand the Jewish people. We Jews understand that it did not take place in seven days, and that's because we know what we're good at. And what we're really good at is bullshit. <laughs> this is a wonderful story that was told to the people in the desert in order to distract them from the fact that they did not have air conditioning. <laughs> I would love to have the faith to believe that it took place in seven days, but I have thoughts. <laughs> and that can really fuck up the faith thing. <laughs> and then there are fossils. Whenever anybody tries to tell me that they believe it took place in seven days, I reach for a fossil and go, fossil. And if they keep talking, I throw it just over their head. When I first heard this, I thought this was funny, but it still was no proof. But I kind of hung on to this whole uh, the little bit where he talked about what the Jewish people believed and that they knew. And so, of course, I had to start researching that. I had never heard it from that angle before. And so, of course, being the Jews are the ones that originally <laughs> wrote the Old Testament... These would be a good people to go to. So I went and researched and their understanding and throughout the different sects and uh, what the orthodox belief system was about um, creation in seven days. And, and of course, most sects of the, uh, you know, most of the Jewish sects do not believe in a literal creation. Uh, and there was a, um, a Jewish rabbi named Rambam Rambam? I, I apologize to anybody Jewish. It's, I'm, I'm butchering that. Rambam or Rambam. Um, and he had said, you know, basically, you know, you know, uh, you know, basically evidence can't, you know, facts or truth can't, you know, conflict with truth. And they had to admit, obviously, the earth is not created in six, seven days. Uh, and, and most Jewish people nowadays believe that this was a very shallow interpretation of what the real creation of the earth, you know, uh, uh, the creation story for the earth really is. It's just a very shallow metaphor. And so that completely just set me back. And so things started to click. So I said, well, maybe, you know, it's possible for the earth to be billions of years old and in God still exists. And that's something that I don't think most creationists will afford, you know, will, will allow it to happen. The Bible has to be 100% completely, literally true. Otherwise, God can't exist. I don't blame him for this. There's a few good scriptures for why they should take the Bible literally. Second uh, Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. 
and 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21 But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And then you have the fact that, um, you know, Jesus, in the uh, New Testament, he spoke of the flood, you know, and they spoke of the you know, creation as if they believed that this was true. Uh, in Jesus' transfig transfiguration, he was up on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And then really, when you think about it, you have to also think about the concept of original sin. I mean, this is an incredibly crucial part uh, to the Christian perspective and to the Christian worldview, uh, at least for these creationists. If Genesis 1 through 3 didn't happen the way that the Bible said it, then how do you account for original sin and where did it come from? Uh, you know, so they have to hold on to that. Uh, it's, it's completely necessary for them, and it would make Jesus completely unnecessary. Um, you know, so when they read these things, of course they're going to think that everything is obviously supposed to be literal. What other choice do they have? And I remember when I was a believer... And, and many Christians will see this now or you know anybody else that remembers times when they were a believer or they went to church. There is such a us versus them mentality. I mean, we're told through scripture and, and through you know, lessons that the people are going to mock us and that we have to defend ourselves and that we need to know what we're, we believe to be able to defend ourselves from and that we need to make an argument for God. We need to stand for God. And so... Those arguments, they're not about evidence or reason or really logic to these people or most of them. They're just, you know, they're not doing it for you. They're not trying to convince you. They, they believe you're deceived and that you're wrong and that they're right. Just kind of like the way that, uh, you know, many Christians handle things like gay rights and whatnot. Or homosexuality uh, you know, uh, is a sin, etc. They believe that the Bible says this, and then they're told that God wants them to defend that, and so no matter what, they're supposed to defend that because in the Bible, God has told them to do so, and they're not going to turn away from God. So they have to defend it. They're trying to prove to themselves, and they're trying to prove to the God that is watching them that they're being faithful, and that they're being loyal. I mean, now, everybody and their mama has covered the Ken Ham, Bill Nye debate. And you can see it in, uh, in his Ken Ham speeches that he doesn't really much care for science. It's not about the science. And I've dealt with the same crap when dealing with thick shades. Uh, we were talking about something, and I, and I brought up um, the volcanoes, the... You know, according to the creationist theory, to the scientists that are trying to prove the flood, um, one of the things they have to explain is the thousands upon thousands of volcanic eruptions um, that, when done, if they would all be at the same time or over a month or a few months or whatever, um, it would spill out so much carbon dioxide and, so, and SO2, sulfuric oxide, so whatever, SO2 and CO2, I'm not a scientist, damn it, whatever those things are, um, that there would have been so much of it that basically everybody would have died. They would not have been able to breathe. It would have changed the earth for a so damn long time, and most creatures would have died, including Noah and company. So when I brought that up with him, uh, basically at first he, he acted like he'd never heard of it before, uh, and that it doesn't, and then it, that it doesn't really matter, because it wasn't rooted in the Bible. And and then he said that it doesn't matter, it doesn't care, because it's not the, what the Bible says. Uh, and I'm maybe taking that just a smidge out of con, or out of you know the proper words, but basically it's still the point. The range of same. It didn't phase him. It didn't matter to him, because it didn't make anything less true. Because it had to be established in God's word. Just like Ken Ham, just the, you go with the fact that the Bible is true 
and then you and you go from there. Uh, and and you, you'll see this with most creationists. They think you're wrong. They think that they're right. And that's what matters. It's not about the evidence. So you have to hit them up another way. You have to reach them in the more of the philosophical context, you know, in the understanding of uh, what makes things true and what is not true. Um, you're never going to get them with science unless they're like myself when I was younger and really actually wanted to learn. But most creationists don't. They just are prepared from going to the answers in Genesis and uh, or watching any other creationist debate or whatever and using those arguments. But again, this is most creationists. But let's just say you choose to engage with a creationist and you want to bring up a point. The thing with them, like most Christians, is their belief system is kind of based on this um, kind of a multifaceted support structure. So even if you take out one thing, it, there's still plenty to, uh, for them to hang on to without, uh, you know, without everything falling apart. So let's just say you come up with a point and, and they really can't answer it. They'll say, well, well, I know that I'm right. Well, at least it's in their head, and they may say it verbally, but in their head, they're thinking, well, I know that the Bible is true, and even though I can't prove anything, I know that somehow you're wrong, therefore I win. Or they'll admit that they have nothing that they can say, and they'll kind of let that slide. Well, look, you know, I don't know what it is. You may be right about that, but however, everything else about the Bible is true. And so even if you found one good magic bullet, one magic silver bullet, it really, there's a, you know, Nine times out of the ten, it really isn't going to affect them. And, and that's a shame, because it's it's more of a sign that they're not wanting to learn. They're just here to defend themselves. And then when you're a creationist, you know, you believe that the Holy Spirit is 100% correct, that God is always correct, that he never lies, and, you know, etc., that the Bible is 100% true they're never going to want to accept the fact that it could be wrong, that even one minute detail could be wrong, because if that's the case, then everything that they know could be a lie, or it could just simply be wrong. You know, it, it's, it's almost a sort of pride that they seem to have, that that they could not be wrong, that their pastor couldn't lie to them, that their family couldn't be, you know, lying to them, or that, or that they or, or heard wrong or interpreted it wrong. That when they themselves read the scriptures, they had to be correct because the Holy Spirit is true and 100% correct and God speaks with me so I know what is true. That they feel almost insulted to the idea that they could be wrong. And so it puts them in this just such an awkward position you know could the holy spirit be wrong can i be wrong no 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 i'm living in the truth i'm always correct uh, you know, i'm a christian you know god says he's true god loves me and i know that i'm right i just can't be wrong and so therefore everybody else has to be wrong it's a um sad state of affairs to live in, to be so delusional, to be so ignorant, and to be so goddamn smug about it, to know that you are special, and that all you know, and God is telling you the truth, and that you know that without a doubt. It's um, and it, it's hard to engage with somebody about that because they're just not willing to be wrong. They admit that it's possible. Even just that some people can be interpreting it wrong. But not them. I used to be a creationist. Now I'm not. Because I was willing to admit that I could be wrong. Uh, because I wanted to learn things. Uh, because I wanted to be justified in everything that I believed. Many creationists are not that way. So should we engage them? 
Absolutely. I mean, why should we let them continue to spout off bad information and bad science? Not for their sake. Not for the creationist's sake. Because those people don't care. They don't really care about, you know, empirical and justifiable truth. They're just defending themselves. They're fighting for God, and they're fighting to show to the other Christians that they're true Christians, to prove to themselves that they're true Christians. But they don't want to learn a full truth. They're happy. They know what they know. And they're fine with that. They've read the Bible, and they've taken what they want to take from it, and they've learned that they need to defend it. That's their job. That's their primary purpose, and they believe it 100%. They're not going to admit that they could possibly be wrong. They're a bit selfish about that. It's very prideful, very arrogant to think that the, the creator of the universe cares about them so much and they direct line feed them the absolute truth and they're afraid they're afraid to be wrong because if God I mean if the Bible is not 100% literally true then everything that they know is wrong and everything they thought about God is wrong but obviously not. There are plenty of liberal Christians out there uh, that don't take the Bible to be literally correct. And that's I, I, it just blows my mind that they can't see that. But they don't want to. If they wanted to, they could see it. But no, it has to be 100% literally true. And that's it. But if you're going to engage with a creationist, you have a long road ahead of you. If you're going to actually think that you're going to try to really convert them. So don't. Don't try and convert them. Um, do it for the people that are on the fence. Do it for the people that are not or that are more like myself back when I was a creationist, that they really wanted to learn. Those are the people that you really need to reach out for. I hope this was helpful to my fellow atheists or agnostics or anybody that's having to deal with a Christian, uh, even a liberal Christian that may be seeing this. Um, you are in a special battle when you're dealing with creationists because you're not dealing with science. You're dealing with uh, that individual's philosophy and understanding of the Bible and what they find to be most important. Um, but if nothing else, uh, I hope this was educational uh, to understand that mindset. Um, we're still people. Creationists are still people. Slightly more wrong people, but people nonetheless. They should be treated with respect. However, their ideas, of course, they should not be treated with respect until it is earned. Um, but remember, it's not about the creationists. It's about those sitting on the fence. Uh, the way that you handle those creationists uh, can be what makes or breaks them. But hopefully, this will help you. This is the Atheist Chef signing off. Peace.